Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the G.I. Joe Amphibious Infantry Fighting Vehicle, the 1988 Warthog and its driver, Sergeant Slaughter. Now, the Warthog makes its first comic book appearance in issue number 92. However, Sergeant Slaughter doesn't make an appearance driving this. As a matter of fact, he makes no appearances in the comic books or the cartoons, which is really very odd because Sergeant Slaughter is actually kind of a licensed character uh, personality, so you would think that Hasbro or Marvel would actually have to use it if they made a uh, figure out of it. I'm not quite sure if that's quite right, though, however, as uh, Blackthorn Publishing's uh, G.I. Joe in 3D number 4 actually did have a very late appearance of Sergeant Slaughter in their comic book, but I'm not really sure whether that's representative of this, what collectors also term as version 3 Sergeant Slaughter, because I don't have that comic book. And I can't really confirm, uh, you know, what his appearance would have looked like in that comic book. Like a lot of 1987 and 1988 characters and vehicles, unfortunately, neither of these appear in the cartoons. The size of the Warthog is actually rather deceptive. I know it sort of fooled me, because in photos, you see the sort of boxiness and the tiny little tracks. You'd think that this was about the size of a, a medium-sized G.I. Joe toy, like their size of the Jeeps, but it's not. There's a three and three quarter inch figure just to give you a sense of scale. This thing is rather large. And so it should be. It's based on the real world AAV-7A, primarily used by the Marines as both a fighter, armored fighter, and a carrier. And it certainly lives up to the carrier part because the Warthog here can comfortably house nine figures on the inside of the vehicle. The Warthog has these uh, non-moving treads with these fake little wheels underneath here, like a lot of G.I. Joe vehicles, so that it rolls on flat ground a little easier. On the back portion, we have these fold-out doors. And one thing you have to look out for if you're looking for a Warthog on the aftermarket is to make sure these uh, almost strut-like hinges are still on here as they're fairly easy to crack off. I'm not quite sure why they decided to use these rather unusual uh, hinges rather than a uh, tried and proven hinge clip. On the inside we have, even though it's, um, it's built for uh, six figures to sit in here, I'm sure you can cram a few more figures in. But as you can see on the inside we have these uh, weird little T-bars and that's actually um, supposed to go over the laps of figures when they're sitting down like this and it does actually hold them in fairly well you just have to make sure that the t-bars are actually still in there this is one of the two for the side bars of course we have the same thing on the other side, along with the same type of door. It has only one of these struts, a rather long portion with no portion in the middle. And unlike the uh, the T bars on the sides, this one, in addition to being um, held in by the struts, we have two little foot pegs. And I'm pretty sure those are for the rear passengers. One of the most commonly lost portions of the Warthog is its antenna. One of the things you won't find on a real world AAV 7A is the Warthog's missile launcher which swivels all the way around on its base, but doesn't elevate, which is kind of strange. Taking a look at the uh, rather distinctive missile with its big uh, flow ring here. One interesting thing is the uh, missile 
is a two-stage rocket. The front part is what detaches and the main rocket is right here. Usually you'll find a two-stage rocket with the rear portion detaching. If you're looking for a Warthog on the aftermarket, make sure it still has both of its smoke grenade launchers with the attached hook here. One of the points of this hook is actually for a helicopter to uh, use its rescue hook and winch to lift this thing up, or lift the whole vehicle up, I should say. But what happens is that this thing pops up by going up straight, so it's actually fairly easy to lose. And of course, we have one on the other side as well. The Warthog has an anti-personnel machine gun on the top, which swivels around. It sort of hits the uh, crow's nest turret there. One nice thing about the machine gun, however, is that the handle is actually angled downwards, making it actually kind of easy for a figure to hold on to this while sitting in this uh, turret. Of the three crow's nest turrets on here, the two rear ones open up with these rather convenient levers on the back of the lids. The one on the right here, which controls the machine gun, has a normal facing seat. However, oddly enough, the one on the left is facing this way. I'm just assuming that that's, uh, that's the operator of the mi missiles, maybe. Interestingly enough, they actually gave some thought of um, uh, the, the view here, because this one doesn't open up this way, which would be in the view of this guy, but sideways instead. And I'm guessing that this is the uh, driver's portion, as not only does he have the... Uh, crow's nest slots, but he also has a, an extended slot right here. And finally, it just wouldn't be a classic G.I. Joe vehicle if it didn't have an opening engine cover. And this is yet another item that you have to look out for uh, as it's easily lost on the aftermarket. Amphibious Infantry Fighting Vehicle. Wait, Amphibious? Wait a minute. Yes, it floats, and quite well and evenly too. Although I shouldn't be surprised, as construction-wise it is made out of a hull and body pieces. So, good job Hasbro. The Warthog came with the third version of Sergeant Slaughter, perhaps his least known outfit. One of the strange things that I, I've mentioned before about the license of Sergeant Slaughter's image is I mean, he's covered with like uh, a gun belt and he has like a knife. There's a real suggestion here that he is a soldier, an armed soldier. And it's very it's very odd because the the image that is licensed for Sergeant Slaughter actually maintains that he be unarmed. So this is actually a very strange move by Hasbro sculptors. And it's not like this figure is like some type of a, a recycle just using Sergeant Slaughter's head. No, it, it's clearly supposed to be Sergeant Slaughter, just a more I guess a soldier version of him. Uh, and also very interesting is that this version of Sergeant Slaughter comes with a removable campaign hat. Well, I'm, I'm loosely calling it a campaign hat because it has these ribs, almost like a um, safari hat, rather than the uh, folds that the campaign hat normally has. And again, I mentioned that it's odd that he comes with a removable helmet uh, hat because one of the Parts of his sort of set in stone uh, image of Sergeant Slaughter is that he always has his hat, or he doesn't, or if he doesn't have his hat, he uh, quickly gets it. Uh, especially uh, true in the cartoon where that is 
certainly one of the licensing agreements that the Sunbow had to do is that every time he loses a hat, he has to get it back right away and put it back onto his head. It's almost like it's, it's part of him. So to actually have a removable hat where you can actually just plain lose it, um, that's a very interesting move. Again, Sergeant Slaughter is a very tall figure. He is actually four inches tall rather than the three and three quarter inches. Here I'm just using Shockwave again just to show you the average three and three quarter inch figure. And, yep, he towers over him. Again, saying that this is just not a recycled figure and he was indeed sculpted to be like this. I don't know whether this is a good point or a bad point, but concerning the Warthog doubles as a figure carrier, I was really surprised to find out that the track fenders didn't have foot pegs to attach further action figures to. While it is historically accurate that soldiers do ride on the outside of a real armored personnel carriers, I have to admit the toy does look that much better without the foot pegs. And speaking of the looks, this thing came out in 1988 when a lot of the other G.I. Joe toys were very science fiction -y looking, so it's really hard to choose something bad about the toy, other than the fact that I really wish the uh, personnel crew doors was at the very back like real world armored personnel carriers, rather than at the sides because opening the side doors really gets in the way of the missiles as well as the rear turrets. Once again, it is nowhere stated that Sergeant Slaughter is a Marine, though it is pretty clear he is one from the details, like the USMC belt buckle he has, and it even has a tiny little bird and ball in the middle of that. The figure by itself used to be fairly easy to come by, still sealed on the uh, driver bubble, perhaps as some um, factory overstock or something. Though be careful, as the hat is prone to discoloration, even in the bubble, it can appear to have brown spots over time. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.